Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Love Fruit podcast and today we've got a, a guest who's a friend of mine that I've known for a, a whole number of years who I believe kind of started on this journey to better health uh, probably around about the same time as myself and I met him probably seven or eight years ago at the Woodstock Fruit Festival and I'm talking about Dr. Benjamin Benoulis and when I met him he wasn't Dr. Ben but I think he was a uh, I don't know, engineer Ben or something like that. We'll probably find out more about that. And um, Ben's went through an incredible transformation in his health and, on, and now is on a journey. Uh, to, he's got to the point where he's now helping other people in profound ways with his with uh, chiropractic and with health, with diet, lifestyle and other things. So I'm looking forward to uh, learn more from Ben today. And I think he's got a lot to share with us. But before we get started, Ben, is there anything else you want to say in your introduction to yourself? Uh, no, no, that, that, um, that's pretty much it. That's a good synopsis. So we'll, we'll, we'll dig into it more and get into to, uh, some cool stories. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, great. So how did this all start for you? Like, where did you, I, I'm guessing that you probably didn't start off with an alternative diet that maybe you were probably brought up like a lot of people, but I'm not sure exactly. So how did it all start off for you? And when did you start making changes to your lifestyle? Um, I, yeah, I was pretty much brought up in a standard American diet household. Uh, I think we ate a healthier version of the standard American diet than most. Uh, I wasn't really allowed to have like uh, sugary cereals or, um, f you know, um, fast food, very much like very mm -hmm. limited amounts. Like if, if, my you know parents got me that it was like let me know that it was like a a rare once in a once in a while thing yeah um uh i know so i mean i'd say the major changes didn't really happen till about 10 years ago but uh there were some things that kind of happened along the way like when i was um three or four years old uh i saw a turkey get killed at thanksgiving and mm. um that really after I saw that, I didn't want to eat um, chicken or turkey ever again. And that was from like age four on, like it's basically as long as I can remember. Um, when I was 23, I, I met a girl who started dating a girl who was vegetarian. She challenged me to do it for like the month of February, like nine years ago, or no, it was like 2005. It was a long time ago. And uh, so did that and then ended up just staying vegetarian, but pretty much you know, <laughs> eating um, standard American diet as a vegetarian, more fast food because I was on my own and I could pretty much just eat what I wanted. And I never really had problems with my weight or problems with my health or, you know, any of that. And so I just sort of chalked it up to good genes that I could get away with eating unhealthy in, you know, modest amounts and everything would be fine. But fast forward to uh, 2010, um, it really starts catching up with me. You know, and everyone said, oh, it'll, it'll catch up with you. You know, you'll get, you'll gain weight, you'll get fat, you know, when you're older, blah, blah, blah. And uh, it did catch up with me, but not in the way that sort of everybody prognosticated. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I developed um, a number of, of uh, chronic health conditions about 10 years ago that just sort of crept up on me over the course of the year. And so I uh, developed... Um, really bad digestive problems. Whereas like every meal I ate was just like killing me and um, started developing eczema on my hands, uh, started having really bad fatigue where I was like knocking back two, three monster energy drinks a day just to kind of get through the work day. And then, you know, if I didn't drink them like on the weekend or something, I was sleeping most of the weekend. Uh, just really didn't, didn't feel good. I had a uh, chronic muscle pain that really didn't seem to respond to, to pain medication. Didn't really respond. It seemed, it was just sort of my muscles just kind of always ached. And, um, and then, yeah, uh, brain fog where it was getting really difficult to do my job. And, you know, I worked uh, as an engineer at, at this microchip company and I was a top performer at one point. And then things just started to slide because my health overall was just going down again, I looked the same on the outside. I didn't gain any weight. I didn't, you know, I had skin condition on my hands, which was kind of embarrassing. 
I wouldn't want to shake people's hand. I, I would try to keep my hands in my pockets in social situations. But other than that, I looked normal. Like you couldn't really tell from the outside that I was having problems. Um, and so, yeah, so that was sort of the beginning of uh, illness for me. And I didn't really, there was nothing, there was no name for it. Um, there wasn't something that anybody else had. It was a bunch of vague symptoms that were kind of hard to pinpoint. It's like, you have disease X, so you take drug Y or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So um, eventually started going to doctors. Mainly, I think the digestive symptoms were the ones that was like really starting to ruin my life, like really get in the yeah. way of just life. Because when you eat a meal and you have to like lie down, clutching your sides for like an hour, because you're in, you know, nine out of 10 pain, <laughs> like it, it starts, that starts affecting your life, right? Like you can't just go out and like, you know, have lunch with friends. Like you got to strategically plan your, your meals uh, around like pain and discomfort and all this stuff. Yeah. So I uh, started to go see, you know, mainstream Western doctors. Cause that's all I knew. And that's really all I thought, you know, worked. Um, and um, you know, got put on, you know, some over the counter drugs initially for, you know, like a steroid cream for the hands and a, and a, um, you know, uh, getting put on like just, um, what are those little pink pills, Pepto-Bismol for my, uh, stomach issues or taking yeah. lactate so that maybe dairy wasn't digesting so well, but I didn't really know what was going on. And, um, did lab work on me, you know, everything comes up normal. Okay. Like, Oh, you know, everything, you're fine. Like, uh, just, you know, take these prescription drugs and, you know, um, you know, try not to eat too heavy a meal and, um, you know, not, we can't find anything wrong with you. Like the labs say nothing. So you must be okay. And I'm like, I'm not okay. <laughs> you know, and I'm pretty much just getting, getting the runaround, you know, like I'm not getting any answers and no one seems to really, like acknowledge how bad it is or understand. And I, I don't know, I feel like, I don't know if I'm like speaking a foreign language, but they just don't get like, I am not well. Like, it, okay, I know the labs don't show anything and this doesn't look like any disease you've seen in any textbook, but I am suffering, help yeah. me. Yeah. And um, it, it just, it just didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And um and so, uh, you know, eventually I thought, well, you know, I have these digestive problems, like maybe, maybe what I'm eating has something to do with it, you know, because the gastrointestinal <laughs> doctor told me, oh, no, like what you eat doesn't have anything to do with your digestive problems, right? Oh, wow. Like, and I believed him for a long time um, because, yeah, you know. It, did you want to believe him as well? Like at that point, if he'd said to you, you have to completely change your diet, do you think you were ready to do that or? Did, did part of you want to hear that as well? Or what do you think? <clears throat> um, I think I wouldn't have been like, oh man, no way. But I've been like, yeah, you know what? Like taking an inventory of how bad that I ate. I've right. been like, yeah, there's some room for improvement. <laughs> um, if they were like, you got to, you know, get rid of all this junk food and no longer have energy drinks and, you know, no longer eat Thai food and, you know, um, no more bread and, and, um, you know, all, like all these staples in my diet, you got to kick that all out and you're eating like pineapple and mangoes and romaine lettuce for the rest of your life. I'd have been like, Oh, I don't think so. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, I mean, it's hard to postulate, you know, hard to theorize would I have been open to that feedback, but I think it, it wouldn't have surprised me, but at the same time, it was very enabling to be told, Oh, what you're eating has nothing to do. Right, like, I'm right. an expert. I have, I have a gastroenterologist. I haven't studied anything about nutrition, but I have studied a lot of other stuff. And so <laughs> I know that nutrition can't be a factor, like, like by some sort of process of elimination that I know everything else. So even though I know nothing about this, it can't be this, right? And, you know, I tell people is that, you know, there's this tube inside of you and the inside of this tube is, you know, diseased, inflamed, and irritated. The only thing that passes through this tube, the only thing that actually touches the inside of this tube inside your body is the food that you eat. Yeah. But trust me, the only thing that touches the tube has nothing to do with why said tube is diseased, inflamed, and irritated. <laughs> yeah. Like it just, does, it just doesn't hold water when you like really kind of look at it at a fundamental level. But the medical profession holds a lot of clout. 
and you know people and i've even noticed this um as a as a non-medical doctor that i tell people something and i gotta be careful because they will go and repeat it and believe it and you know my doctor said this and just you know um take it as like undeniable fact, unquestionable fact right um and and you know doctors are human beings they're fallible and they they have limited understanding and sometimes they're not always right uh doesn't make them a bad person doesn't make them uh incompetent in their profession that can't no one can be expected to know everything yeah um so I basically, I went and I got a food allergy test because I had heard about some, one of my friends who, um, you know, was dealing with a lot of like stomach bloating issues that were very visible, improved. And I kind of asked her, I was like, what, what's going on? She's like, well, my acupuncturist said I need to do a food allergy test. And I found out I was allergic to gluten. And I almost laughed. I was like, you're, you're what? It said you couldn't eat what? Like, uh, I kind of laughed it off. But in the back of my mind, I'm going, you know, her stomach that was always bloated, like stopped. So maybe, maybe some, they're on to something because I'm not getting any help going the Western way, going the traditional way. So if I got to talk to a wacky puncturist and stop eating gluten, like, you know, maybe and I can get some results out of that. Like I'm willing to give it, willing to give it a go. <laughs> So I go and I get the food allergy test. And this was very interesting because my insur- up until now, my insurance covered everything. Like I had this fantastic health insurance. But to get a food allergy test, uh, I had to pay out of pocket like $175, which, yeah. you know, uh, was a fair amount of money. Um, but I was just really wanting to know. And so it took like a while to get the results back from the lab. They drew like four vials of blood. And I uh, finally get the call. And, um, you know, the, the doctor calls me back. He's like, well, Mr. Benilla, so we got your data back from the lab and uh, we tested your blood against a variety of allergens and on a scale of one to seven, which I don't know where they come up with these numbers, but uh, you tested a seven for the following foods. And the guy just proceeds to rattle off like a long list of everything I'm already eating, right? Like soy, gluten, wheat, brewer's yeast, dairy, casein, um, milk, uh, just all, all, all the stuff that's in processed foods pretty sure. much like, and, uh, and I'm just thinking like, whoa, <laughs> myself, like, guy, you're, you're listing off everything that I eat. What, what, what am I going to eat now? Like gluten-free air sandwiches. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I said, oh, okay, well, you know, a doctor has diagnosed me. So this is, you know, has some clout to it. This is a medical doctor telling me I have multiple food sensitivities or allergies. What medication are you going to give me is what I ask him. Cause that was my level of consciousness at the time. Like you've told me about the disease. Mm-hmm. Now you prescribe me the cure, which is obviously must come in pill form. Um, so he's like, Oh, well there's no, you know, uh, medication for these uh, food allergies. You just have to cut the foods out of your diet. <laughs> and it was like, just like a giant record scratch. Like I have to, what I have to, I have to who? Yeah. Um, so it was very like, it was like wake up call. It was kind of like, yeah, I mean, I thought I might have to cut a thing or two out of my diet, but it really have to basically stop eating everything that I was eating. Um, so it was like, you know, it was definitely a, a, um, like humbling and it was kind of worse news than I was kind of anticipating. I thought, oh, one or two things, I'll get rid of them and then everything will be fine and I can go back to, you know, my lifestyle that's poisoning me. Um, but it didn't work out that way. So I started just like trying to find like the gluten-free, soy-free, fun-free version of my favorite packaged foods that I was eating. Um, you know, like, it, oh, like have go to the restaurant and order with rice noodles instead of wheat noodles. Um, and so I was doing this and I was buying a bunch of, you know, still microwave packets, processed foods that just didn't have, you know, some of the allergens. Yeah. And uh, let me tell you, uh, 
tasted terrible. Tasted like cardboard. I mean, this was 10 years ago. I think some of these things have come a certain way since then. Like the, the ability to make these allergen free packaged foods has like improved. Uh, but it didn't taste too good. And uh, I didn't really feel that much better. Like I felt like, you know, maybe 10 to 20% better. So I would continue to just like fall off the way. Like, oh, I want to eat regular pizza. Like I'm going to eat regular pizza. Like I can't eat this gluten-free pizza, dairy-free pizza. Like this, I'm getting sick of this. I want to just go to Home Slice and get like regular pizza. <laughs> um, so, and then I would get sick again and I would waffle back and forth. And uh, eventually um, I just got sick of being sick. And I had this idea like, okay, let's go because I did not want to learn how to cook anything or like make my own food. That was out of the question. You know, I was like, you know, I had the, all these scripts of like, I'm busy. I'm an engineer. I don't have time. I'm not, you know, I'm a man. I, that's cooking is not my job. Um, so I thought, okay, lazy man mode. Let's just make smoothies. Right. Because smoothies is a lot like making smoothies, is a lot like making microwave food. Okay. Because what do you do? You open up the machine, you throw the food inside, you close the machine, you hit a button, and then 30, 60 seconds later, your food's ready, right? <laughs> so one of them zaps it with radiation, the other one just has a blade that spins. Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, you know, a smooth, you know, blenders, pretty much like a microwave, I'll just take whatever produce I got laying around in the fridge and um, just kind of throw it in there, you know, bam, smoothie, right? Easy, you know, easy, easy. Mm -hmm. I want it easy. And smoothies made it easy. So I started drinking the smoothies. And um, that definitely digested way better than, you know, the gluten-free, um, soy-free, dairy-free Amy's macaroni and cheese. Okay. Um, but uh, there was a few problems. Like the smoothies weren't always tasting good. Like, you, you know, you put tomato and banana and spinach in the same smoothies, <laughs> like kind of yuck, you know. So maybe you just kind of you hold your nose and you knock it back. And uh, eventually I got to a point where like, you know, these smoothies are kind of working. It's convenient. It, it like, um, it doesn't like rip up my digestion so much. Like I, some of them taste really good. I'm kind of, I know it's good for me that I'm eating more fruits and vegetables. Like this feels kind of, I'm going in the right direction, but I, I got to figure out like some actually good smoothies. Cause it's like, a toss up, whether it's going to taste good. You know, I can't just be throwing whatever in there. Hmm. I need some recipes. So that was pretty much the start of my raw food journey. I went and typed smoothie recipes into the search bar on YouTube and whoa, I did not know <laughs> what I was in for. Uh, <laughs> so that's what I found. Uh, Dan, the man, the life regenerator McDonald. Right. You know, and this was 2010. He was, I think he was still living in an RV in the woods in Washington state, uh, United States. And, uh, he was just, um, he was just making smoothies and juices like in front of his RV. And, uh, you know, it's a guy like for those of you who, who are listening, who haven't heard of him, uh, you know, he's definitely a raw food OG. And so he was a long haired hippie guy, shirtless, shoeless, you know, living out of his RV in the woods, making, you know, making raw food recipes. Yeah. And uh, that was kind of my introduction to it. And so, yeah, started watching the video, started uh, making more smoothies, got a juicer because he was all about the green juice. And I was like, wow, that's a really good idea. And initially I kind of thought he was this like stupid, you know, guy, you know, guy who kind of smoked too much, you know, dope in the nineties. And <laughs> it was just kind of a burnout, but like the more I listened to what he had to say, it actually made sense. And, um, and so I got, you know, just, a lot of principles that I had never heard before. Like instead of fighting disease, just try to create health and, you know, fruits and vegetables are the healthiest food. So if you want to get well, it's like the more of them you eat, the better your health will be. Sure. And um, it's like so fundamental and elementary and like, you know, um, just empirically obvious, but like no one had ever really said that kind of stuff before. And um, so it's one of those things that's almost so simple. You think the person must be an idiot but then you're like, you're doing it. And you're like, I'm getting results. This is working. Maybe this guy is actually onto something. And all those medical doctors were like clueless. Mm -hmm. um, and so I get really into it and I'm just like, I'm eating more and more raw and I'm, and I'm avoiding like, you know, more and more processed foods, really trying to like narrow in the diet 
and get rid of um, you know, all the stuff. And, you know, within, you know, three months of eating mostly raw, like all my symptoms are just vanishing, right? Like the skin clears up, the energy's like through the roof. Um, the muscle pain is long. I was gone within a week or two. Um, the digestion is way better as long as I'm sticking a program. And when I don't, I feel it. Like if I go back and I have a regular pizza, Oh my God, <laughs> my body is not happy. Um, and so that was, that was kind of the, the tipping point for me. That was really what got me started. And then, you know, finding other raw food people on YouTube, um, during Ryder, um, Michael Arnstein, uh, Michael Velocity, uh, you know, and just Chris Kendall and just getting like, I was at work, like watching, you know, two hours of YouTube a day. Cause I was just like trying to be immersed in this world when the outside world was telling me like, you know, you, you know, go get, um, you know, uh, new number seven from the Chinese restaurant. So that's kind of how it began. That's amazing. Great story. And, uh, at that point, what was happening? Obviously there was YouTube was happening a big thing. Were you on like, uh, 30 bananas a day and stuff and websites like that. Oh yeah. 30 bananas a day. It was popping. I was, I had a blog and I was like posting everything like, you know, a, a few posts a day, like a journal and, you know, videos and everyone like, was like meeting all these people from all over the world who were on a similar journey and it was exciting. And this, this whole new world had opened up to me, you know, it's just, I like, remember, it was I remember you had a video that was like something like, uh, something like doing eight, eight to 10, 10 in the corporate world or something like that. And it was like, yeah. you, you were taking your smoothies into work in a little, in a kind of freezer bag thing. And yeah. that was what, that was probably the first time I came across anything you were doing. Um, and then, uh, you, we went to the Woodstock fruit festival. Yeah. I you thought about going in, in 2011, but I found out about it maybe like a month before it was going on and right, just like yeah. the price and the timing, I couldn't, couldn't swing it, but I was like, next year I'm going. And I think like, like, um, you know, the, the way they did it at the time and maybe they still do it this way. It was like, they, as soon as the, the festival ends, they put this, the tickets for the next year on sale at the lowest possible price, like immediately. Right. And then the, ticket price just kind of goes up throughout the year. I bought my ticket. Like as soon as the first food festival ended, I was like, I'm going next year. I don't yeah. care. Vacation time. They can fire me from my job. Like I don't, I'm going. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I was gung ho to go in 2012. And I think that's where we, we met initially. Yeah. I don't know if I actually spoke to you that first festival, but I remember you. And uh, I think, um, I think you might've done some comedy at the talent show maybe. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I did. Um, there was a talent show, and I was like, "Can I do comedy?" And because um, I, I that was kind of a hobby of mine. I was doing stand up comedy, and I had um, I had prepared this like um, impersonation of Durian Rider, who at the time was kind of like top of the heap. Like everybody was trying to hang out with him and talk to him, and he, his YouTube channel was like blowing up, and everybody looked up to him. And, but at the same time, he was the kind of guy who, um, you know, you could make fun of him or, or, or troll him or whatever. And he'd kind of just play into it. Like he liked the attention. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wasn't like upsetting him by doing like a, uh, impersonation of him. Like he la like <laughs> everybody thought it was funny. He thought it was funny. And then the next day, you know, at a festival with like hundreds of people, I went from just being some dude to like everybody was coming up to me and being like that impersonation was so awesome. Yeah. And then like Mike Arnstein and Tim Van Orden are like, you want to come on a run with us? Like, man, that, that comedy act was like so good yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I just like skyrocketed onto to everybody's radar with that. That was kind of like, <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Uh, but I was like, I'm going to go on a run with Arnstein and Van Orden. Like I'm not that fast guys. <laughs> like I'm not that fast, <laughs> but they, everybody just wanted to chill with me. And so, it was kind of nice social currency at the time. Um, yeah. So from there, I mean, I remember I was following you for a while. You were, you were doing videos for a number of years, um, but you made a decision to go into chiropractic and, and or I, I guess the first decision you made was that you wanted to start helping people with this. And then you were looking for an avenue to do that and you decided on chiropractic. And how did all that happen? Like, was it just a natural progression from, uh, from 
being at Woodstock and different things like that? Um, I think so. I think, um, you know, like many people who have a corporate job, they feel kind of trapped in it, you know, um, uh, especially, you know, whether it's a good job or a bad job, like if it's a really bad job or the pay isn't too great and they get treated poorly and they, they feel really trapped in it. I was in a fortunate position where like the pay was really good. Um, I had great coworkers. It was a great company. Um, but at the same time I felt like, man, this, I had been doing the engineering thing for, you know, you know, since I graduated and it always felt like this isn't really me. Like I have a talent and a knack for this and I can make good money at it. So I'm kind of like obligated to do it because that's what everybody expects of me. But it was, I, but I didn't know what it was actually passionate about. Like I was mm -hmm. like, you know, I can't like, I had tried the stand-up comedy thing that was fun, but um, it, I knew I wasn't one of doing it professionally um, for a number of reasons. Um, so, uh, you know, the whole health thing happened and I really saw like it really op shifted my paradigm of like how um, health works, how I didn't have a concept of that, how science works, um, how medicine and healthcare works. It was like, whoa, everything you thought you knew just blown out the window. And it was not something that I read on a conspiracy, you know, blog. Yeah. It was something I experienced firsthand of like, I reversed this disease um, that everyone said, you know, was just like, oh, your blood, everything's normal. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, that like other people were suffering and being put on, you know, immunosuppressive drugs and all this yeah. stuff. And, um, and, you know, I would try to talk to people about it and, it and it was like, you're speaking a foreign language. It's like, you try, you just go up to someone who speaks English and you're trying to talk to them in Dutch and you're all excited about it. And you're just like, burr, 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 burr. and they're like, oh, what? I don't understand you. What are you so excited about? And you're like, mangoes, mangoes is what I'm excited about. <laughs> um, so I kind of got this sense that I really wanted to help people um, because I, you know, go into the festivals and you hear these stories of people who had, you know, overcome these, you know, serious chronic health conditions mm -hmm. that uh, most of the time that mainstream medicine labels as incurable. Yeah. And, you know, some people have, have, have reversed them. Some people are kind of on that path or they're struggling with it, but you kind of realize, you know, just how bad it is out there. And that a lot of these uh, diseases, especially the autoimmune ones, um, there's no outward signs or symptoms or there's no outward signs. Like you can't tell by looking at somebody that they have endometriosis or ulcerative colitis or ankylosing spondyl, any of this. Um, and I realized I had the skills, all, the beginnings of the skill set or most of the skill set to help people. And I really wanted to, and I had always been passionate about math and science. And I thought, well, you know, there were all these doctors who couldn't help me, but like, I'm pretty smart. And I know this stuff and I have experience with it. Like I could help those people that they couldn't help. And obviously there was a glaring need for it, you know, because, yeah. um, you know, it's like mainstream medicine still wants to believe that like the major threats to human health are like, you know, um, erectile dysfunction and like the coronavirus, you know, <laughs> um, but you know, it's actually heart disease, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune disease. Um, and since they don't really have a good solution set for that, they don't really like talk about it too much. It's just sort of expected right. everybody croaks of a heart attack and everybody gets cancer and, you know, um, autoimmune disease, you know, just not talked about diabetes. is just, you know, a side effect of growing old. Yeah. And, um, and so I wanted to help people. And so, but I knew I didn't want to do drugs or surgery that I just, and there was no way I was going to go to medical school and like learn all that stuff only to not use it. Like I wasn't going to sit through it for five years and just say, well, I learned it all, but I don't do it, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, I wanted to have a skill set that could actually, you know, I, I would, that I would use, you know, mm -hmm. because there was a time and place for drugs and surgery. I just didn't want to be the guy who was handling, you know, the emergencies and the, you know, the, the cutting out of the metastasized tumors. Um, like that just was not of interest to me. I wanted to kind of get people before they needed those kind of interventions. Yeah. Um, and so where I, I was living in Texas at the time, naturopathy is not licensed in Texas. Like it's just, it's, I don't want to say it's illegal, but you can't be, call yourself a doctor and do naturopathy. It's just not a thing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so the kind of the other option was to like, and it was to do chiropractic, essentially functioning as de facto naturopath. And I'd been reading a lot of the Herbert Shelton and a lot of the fasting books and the natural hygiene guys were almost all chiropractors, you know, and I realized it sort of gave you a skill set to be able to do that stuff. And I was like, those are kind of the guys that I want to do things like, I'm going to guess I'm going to do what they did. Um, so the plan was to go to chiropractic school, learn that skill set, you know, have, have other, other tools in my tool belt that are, you know, don't have, um, you know, major side effects like chiropractic adjusting, be able to help a larger, a larger subset of people. And, um, but mainly focus on the diet stuff uh, to get people well. So that was kind of the intention. But, um, you know, as we'll talk about kind of hit a few like swerves in the road and stumbled upon some cool things that I got into, uh, you know, along the way. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that the to me the stuff about diet and, and lifestyle is is so life changing in itself. You know, the, the just the the fact that there's people, as you're saying, out there who right now are in pain, are on drugs, are miserable, have kind of lost their entire quality of life, and all it really takes is for them to actually stumble upon this information about lifestyle and changing diet. For many people, that's going to be the, the huge transformative change. For many people as well, though, I think that once you're on that journey, the question is what else is there out there, I think, because once you've made some small changes and it's made a big impact on your health, on your life, on your mindset and everything else, then the question is kind of like where else to go. And once you've kind of sorted your diet out, um, then there's all these other aspects of health to look at. And that's what I'm kind of interested with what you're looking into with chiropractic and everything. I'd like to firstly ask you about, you know, the, the standard, if you want to call it the standard chiropractic that I've seen, uh, the, the stuff that I'm aware of. If I go on YouTube and I type chiropractor, I find a guy that's like cracking someone's neck or cracking someone, like there's a big pop sound and that seems to be like what they're trying, the effect they're trying to get. And, um, and, I've not, I've not been to a lot. Of, I don't think, I've, I think you're maybe the only chiropractor I've really been to. And I think I got a neck adjustment one time from Robert Lockhart. But apart from that, like, I've never really had anything. But let's talk about what, what is, uh, how does that fit into uh, just the, even the just standard practice of chiropractic? How does that fit into someone's like health, health regimen or how they, how they would look after themselves? Sure. And, and first off, just want to take a minute to um, acknowledge Robert Lockhart. Um, sure. He passed away a few months ago and um, damn, I'm getting kind of choked up. He was a mentor of mine when I met him at Woodstock Fruit Festival. Um, he was a chiropractor and a naturopath, actually. Mm. And uh, we had a lot of good conversations. He was super encouraging to me. He was a guy that I, I could always go to when I had questions. And he was just... Um, he was a really good dude. Miss him a lot. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, he was a big I'll, I'll tell you what, Ben, like for me, I when I that, that first year that we were both at Woodstock, like uh he actually came up to me and started speaking to me out of the blue. And I spent some time with him the next morning. Just accidentally went up to the basketball court. And he was working out and I just went over to hang out with him. And I just remember in that moment thinking, this is what I want to be, you know. <laughs> I, I, I want to be the guy who's 70 years old doing pull-ups in the morning, you know, in the sunshine, shirtless, you know, no shoes on, all that stuff. I just thought, this is – and so for me, he was like a clear example to, of, uh, of what was possible. And that's what I got from him. And I think a lot of the commitment I took from – to this lifestyle was was from him because he was completely committed like regardless of how he whether he did it the exact right way or whatever um he was totally all in with uh with with his lifestyle and his approach and yeah and um and and i I took that from him i just took that commitment i just thought yeah just no excuses like just do it just change and try and live a life and try and be like him at some point you know yeah, he he definitely um, you know gave you this example like you keep doing this when you're 70, you'll be walking on your hands, you'll be married to a woman half your age, and you'll be like like killing it. <laughs> uh, 
so um yeah he was uh he was he was you know because people will say oh well this works now but you know what are you gonna do you know in 10 years you know all your teeth are gonna fall out and like you're gonna lose all your hair and you're gonna die <laughs> you know like wither away it's yeah, like yeah, no yeah. this dude look at this guy you know um so he was a good example but i think um chiropractic you know where does it fit in the equation and that that's something i've had a a hard time wrapping my arms around or, or like giving an articulate answer to because i think there are certain things that it can help with and certain things that it can't help with and certain things that um people claim it can help with that i'm sort of that it works for some people and not others um but overall the, what i liked about it was that a lot of the principles of it lined up with raw food, natural hygiene yeah and that was simply that um the body has the innate ability to self heal and self regulate and self organize as long as you provide it the correct um, conditions to do so. So one sure. of those conditions is the food. Like if you, if you give it the proper food and you stop poisoning it with animal foods and processed foods and things like that, that um, it, it can has a much easier time healing itself. Um, and so with chiropractic, the main idea is that there's this nervous system. Okay, you have this brain that sends signals down this information superhighway called your spinal cord, and that has nerves branch off of it that goes to all your muscles, tissues, organs, glands, everything. Mm -hmm. And so if there is interference to this signal from the brain to the body, from the body to the brain, the brain's ability to regulate the body is compromised. And now the brain's ability to, to, um, to uh, heal the body is compromised. Yeah. And so with the chiropractic adjustment, the ultimate goal is to restore normal tone tension and shape to the spine thus allowing you know optimal flow of information and intelligence from the brain to the body um and so there are multiple ways to do this and, and the traditional way that most people know involves a lot of popping sounds <laughs> um, um and so and i love doing it. like i still do these kind of adjustments from time to time it's a lot of fun you know um it's it's uh it's not for everybody, um, but it can help with a variety of conditions. Um, you know, mainly back pain and neck pain is what everybody knows it for, headaches. Um, but when you're working directly with the nervous system, all kinds of conditions that are associated, that are neurological in nature can improve. Um, have seen huge um, improvements for kids with autism, uh, people with uh, anxiety problems and PTSD. Um, basically what it, the adjustment is getting people out of that fight or flight mode right. and into the rest and digest. And so when you can do that, um, a lot of conditions that have to do with stress and trauma and stuff like that, you see improvement. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of people that are, you know, that have a fantastic diet and, and have a lot of good things going for them, but they still got maybe issues with their posture issues with, you know, uh, their neck, their spine, and things like that. So, what what I was thinking of is like this: this there's something in that in the chiropractic that is outside of, like you can't just fix it through diet. There's things that that need maybe adjustment that need some extra help like that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think the the two kind of uh, things you get, I cast a pretty wide net of people I can help now, which is cool. Yeah. Like there's not yeah. you know. Like someone comes in, you know, they got an ar an accident, their arm got ripped off, like, I can't help. Them. Okay. But like pretty much any chronic condition, almost any chronic condition, I can, I can help. Um, and I think you, you mentioned posture. That's Robert Lockhart talked a lot about that. And one of the things he said was that, you know, now in the 21st century, you know, you and I are both sitting in chairs staring at glowing rectangles right now. That is not something we evolved with. Like we evolved in non-seasonal <laughs> tropical rainforest and we were hanging upside down trying to grab mangoes, you know, we, and, and this was, it was natural to always have like, um, you know, a, a stretch in the spine and not compressing yeah. it the way that we do now. And so chiropractic is, is sort of a workaround for a lot of that stuff that the postural debt that we're incurring by, you know, living this 21st century lifestyle. Mm. Um, you know, if you were in the tropics and you were like completely like permaculture, like things might be, and you weren't sitting in a computer all the time, things might be a little different. Um, and you know, a lot of the stress and the trauma that people experience is, you know, from also from living in the 21st century, it's sure. they weren't like, you know, out, you know, picking pineapples and a, and a tiger appeared and they had to run away. Like that was not what happened. Right. Like yeah. that's not where the trauma came from. 
Um, but that nervous system is sort of, uh, you know, evolved in that in that era in that time frame, and it hasn't really adapted to all the just crap we're doing to it now. Um, so you've, uh, you've also taken uh, uh, and you've you went I guess on another, as you were saying, like a little uh, 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 some other um, roots, I guess, uh, and. The thing that I've experienced with you is this thing, network spinal analysis, I think it's called. And I don't yeah. know if that's the only thing that you've done, but what it tied in with me, the interest, because I've always had an interest in the whole idea of the, this concept of energy in the body, of whether that's emotional energy or electrical energy, whatever it is, uh, and these kind of concepts that sometimes come from Eastern ideas and things like that and aren't really spoken about it at all in Western medicine, but um, I've, I've seen a lot of the examples of the thing that you're, in, that you're into. Could you maybe let us know a bit more about it and who it might be of interest to? Sure, so uh, network spinal is a specific chiropractic technique, and it really strives to work directly with the nervous system and, and the energy systems of the body. So. Um, it involves all light touch. It used to be called network spinal analysis. Then they took the analysis off. It's just network spinal. Long story. Um, <laughs> but if you watch the, the Netflix series Goop Lab, there's this guy, John Amaral, and he's doing energy work on Gwyneth Paltrow and all these other people. That's pretty much what I do in practice. And so this just looks at the idea that basically um, we can work directly with the nervous system and through light touches, tell the body to unwind its own tension as opposed to forcing it out of the person with some sort of, um, you know, uh, forceful adjustment that produces a pop. Mm. And uh, I kind of stumbled upon this during chiropractic school, met a, a guy in the field who was doing it. Uh, at the time, one of my dogs had passed away and I had all this like repressed grief that I couldn't let out because I was in school and I was just like working hard studying for exams and it all came out on the table. Like I cried my eyes out the first adjustment. Um, and then that's when I kind of realized like, wow, there's something to this. Um, cause I had had some spiritual experiences on a, on a raw food diet like you have. Mm. Um, but this was kind of like that, but like different. Yeah. Um, it was like, okay, whoa, this was, this is something that like five years ago, I thought anybody would have told me about this it was crazy, but I knew I just had this experience. So I got to go learn about it. Um, and so basically, you know, it's still being studied. There's so, there's so much sure. to study. Um, but we know that people are doing their electrical engineering PhDs on a lot of the, the wave phenomena that happen associated with it and how it affects the nervous system. And they're looking at, at surface EMGs to see what's happening when they're doing this to people. Um, so without getting too much into the weeds, although oh no, oh, look behind me, we're in the weeds. Um, <laughs> basically, the idea is this idea of reorganizational healing that um, we're not trying to fix anybody because no one's broken. That we simply, um, you have a version of yourself that's gotten you this far in life and to go any farther, you kind of need to reorganize and, and, um, and uh, you know, change things up. And so, um, because you can't go back to the way you were because the time is pretty much a one-way street. Like you can't bring somebody back to, Bring me back to 2009 before I got sick with my autoimmune disease, Ronnie. Can't happen, right? Just can't happen. Um, like in 2010, I was good. In 2009, I wasn't. Um, so what we can do is take what we've got and reorganize it to a more optimized version of yourself. And uh, I kind of experienced this firsthand on my raw food journey. Like I experienced reorganizational healing where like um, – in order to heal, I had to change and a lot of things in my life changed yeah. in both like my own health and also my life. Like I, you know, all these new things opened up, I moved, I took on a new career. Um, all these things had to change for me to like really heal. And, uh, and I think that, um, that's, that's what a lot of people fear is like, you know, cause ultimately if they change their diet, a lot of other things are going to change. Um, and so network really, um, you know, brought about this, like articulated this concept that I'd already experienced, which was reorganizational healing that in order to heal, you have to reorganize and, and change who you are as a person to be this better version of yourself that can overcome whatever challenges you're facing. 
And so I have a really hard time doing it all justice, um, but I think that is the best explanation I can give you at this moment. Yeah, great. And, and uh, I mean, I, I'm really interested in this whole concept and I've experienced quite a lot of what you're talking about in, in different ways, not just from you, but in, in different healing sessions and things as well. And uh, I'm a little bit like, I've got this conflict where a lot of people, for example, at the fruit festival I run, there's a lot of people that want to give, you know, therapies and energy stuff and they want to demonstrate some of this stuff or, or offer it. And I, I support it. Like I believe in it, but for, but I always also think that for a lot of people that what they really need to do is like get their diet in line first. Like that's the first thing for me that I think is most important. And a lot of people, end up avoiding making those big changes to go and do this uh, other energy stuff. And, and I think that I've seen people, I mean, I've, I've seen people that went really far down that road of developing that side of things, but never changed their diet or lifestyle and, and kind of thought like they were maybe bulletproof, like kind of like you mentioned earlier on, like because they were doing that stuff, they maybe felt like they didn't have to change anything else. And, um, oh, I see a ton of that. Yeah. So, yeah. So I've, I've tried to like, I always think, it, I, I always like to make sure people understand firstly, like, well, you know, you need to get the, the diet things important, but I've, I've always been interested in that. And the thing that I'm interested in is like, what exactly is it when emotion is trapped in the body? What does that mean? Is that physical? Is that in the brain? Is it chemicals actually trapped in the body? Is it you know, muscles tensed up in some way. I, I'm curious about what that actually is and, and what is it that triggers that release for people of trauma? And because it seems like people store this stuff for decades sometimes. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And, you know, I don't think we fully understand, but I can explain it as best I know. Um, but this idea that emotions only happen in the brain is pretty antiquated and actually been disproven under laboratory conditions and that the idea that the mind is you know centralized only in the brain is is also you know a concept we know you know can't be true that we have other bundles of nerves in our gut and other areas that um, function as second and third brains um, and so my understanding is that a lot of this emotion is stored actually in the fascia in the connective tissue and so fascia for those of you who are listening and have heard of it's a very thin layer of like saran wrap level connective tissue that surrounds every muscle, surrounds every organ. You know, um, it's, it, it connects a lot of things together and it has its own neural network. Okay. So it, um, it uh, you know, has innervation. It can send and receive information to the body um, and it has the ability to expand and contract. Um, so, um, a lot of times that the information that's stored in it is emotion. And um, so when we, you know, use these light touches, we get the nervous system to release some of the tension in the fascia. Well, along with that is, is stored trauma and emotion. Why is it, why is the body storing trauma? Well, a lot of times when these really traumatic things happen, like a sexual assault or witnessing a, a murder or some other, you know, a severe car accident or, or whatever it is, um, that the nervous system kind of gets overloaded and can't process it all at once. So it just sort of tucks it away somewhere. Like it can't just let it pass through. Like it has to, it knows that it has to process it. So it tucks it away in the connective tissue and says, I'll deal with that later. <laughs> right now, a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> and so it gets tucked away. But the thing is we live in the 21st century. We're not being mindful and meditating. And, you know, we have a lot of stress as it is. So the system just kind of is trying to, triage as best it can but it's like ah, i got this backlog of stuff i'll get to it later and it never really does right um but these these kind of um modalities that that, that work with it bring this stuff up to be processed and you kind of got to be careful because if you bring it up too much at once well then you overload the system all over again you re-experience the trauma and you don't really heal from it um so it, it kind of has to be released in a way that's you know bite-sized and, and conducive to actually processing it um, but, uh, there's a really good book. You might've read it, Ronnie, for those people who are listening and are interested in this kind of thing, it's called molecules of emotion by Dr. Candace Pert, who's a PhD, uh, Johns Hopkins university biochemist. 
-hmm. and she wrote all of the book all about everything she'd studied with this um and that there, there mm -hmm. there's a um there seems to be a, a, a chemical component there also seems to be sort of a vibrational co component that like the tissue is held at this certain um tensile strength and that is a certain vibrational frequency when that's released the vibrational frequency changes um so there's like a a wave element to it whether it's you want to say it's electrical waves or sound waves yeah. or ultrasound or something there um and that um you know it's like she did this test where they would um you know um shock the system in some way and then see see where the emotions like where the chemicals showed up and things like that. And they realized like sometimes these chemical responses of these neurotransmitters were showing up in areas of the body that like the brain couldn't reach there fast enough to tell it to do that. So it must have happened locally before it happened at the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you know, if you really, and just empirically, if you think back to the time you felt a strong emotion, like say you were um, driving in your car and all of a sudden the car in front of you stopped and you had to like slam the brakes yeah. really hard, you know? Yeah. Um, you might feel a sense of fear or shock, um, but oftentimes you're not gonna, like you actually feel it as a palpable sensation somewhere in your body, like in your chest or in your arms or your legs or your groin or, or whatever. Um, you actually feel the, the emotion, even though it's not a tactile sense, um, you, you feel, feel it physically in parts of your body. And that is more evidence that essentially emotions are stored in the physical body and not just the brain. And whether they're stored in the brain even at all, I, I can't, you know, you know, neither confirm nor deny, but I can definitely say that they are stored in the connective tissue in various parts of the body. That's, yeah, I've never heard of that book, Molecules. Well, I might have heard of it, I've not read it. So that's definitely something to check out. Um, does this also apply, like, does this, uh, does this all tie in with ideas like uh, yoga kriyas and kundalini energy and chi and things like this and Eastern stuff? Is, is, is this tied in in some way? I think so. Um, it, there's definitely, um, you know, energy flow going through the system. The spine seems to be very involved. Um, you know, it, yeah, it's called kundalini and, um, you know, the, Ayurvedic sense or Indian sense. I, I'm not sure proper terms for that. Uh, chi or ki in, in um, you know, uh, Chinese, um, Chinese medicine. I think they're pretty much all the same. There's some sort of life force energy that's flowing through the body, um, whether it's through the spine or through um, these meridians. Fun fact about the, the acupuncture meridians. There's like a 95% correlation between where the, the meridians are and mm -hmm. the intersection of the various planes of fascia. Oh, wow. So we know that this energy is traveling through the, the fascia. Um, and that it's, 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 a, it's a conductor of this energy. What is it? Don't really know. Um, and so that's when people get annoyed because it's like, well, you're not talking about kilojoules or megawatts. So I don't, it, it just sounds yeah. like hogwash to me. Yeah, it's never really been, as far as what, uh, science is concerned, as far as I know, conventional science would say that that's never been measured or found or and especially stuff like, especially when people talk about energy fields around the body and things like that, like that's not like they would suggest they've not got any way of measuring that, whatever that may or may not be. Um, yeah. But I mean, so, that's, yeah. Um, so we know we have reason to believe it exists, but we don't have the, the um, necessarily tools to qualify or quantify. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, we know that it's there. We just don't fully understand it. Uh, you take something, somebody like, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's like, you know, talks about something like dark energy and dark matter. Like basically this idea that we've, you know, we've got the Hubble telescope and these telescopes and we've mapped the, the galaxies and the known universe. And, um, you know, we look at how big the universe is and, you know, the laws of gravity and we figure like, okay, we've kind of see what stars and planets are out there. But when we do the math, there's all this mass that should be out there and all this energy that's out there that we can't account for. We can't see it, but we know through our math and the models that we have that it must exist. And they call this dark energy or dark matter. And so it's essentially we've 
our math shows that there's energy in the universe that's unaccounted for. We can't measure, but we know it must be there. Um, but then someone like you or I says, well, I think I, I have an understanding of this energy and where some of it is and how to, how to, um, you know, uh, manipulate it or, or coax it or work with it. They go, Oh, what are you crazy? Uh, energy <laughs> work. Oh, you know, but at the same time, we know that there's unaccounted for energy in the universe. So Interesting. that's kind of my, my, my spin on it. Well, excellent. I mean, what, what are you, so what are you doing right now and what are you doing in the future? What are your plans and things? What, what have you got coming up? Um, so mainly, um, the thing I am doing locally, you know, running a, running a, um, uh, chiropractic office, doing network smile in Phoenix, Arizona, um, doing, uh, comedy here and there for fun. And then, um, the main thing online is, um, teaching and coaching about how to reverse autoimmune disease with diet and lifestyle. Uh, that's, that's my passion. And how that's, do people like learn more about you and where can they find more of this information? Sure. So I'm active on some of the social media programs, probably um, Instagram the most, and then Facebook and YouTube. It's my name, Dr. Benjamin Benulis. Type that in, you'll find me. Um, and then I wrote sort of like a, a, a blueprint ebook free guide that basically teaches you like the, the brass tacks fundamentals of, of reversing autoimmune disease. There's a website for that, autoimmunerecoveryblueprint.com. You go and you download it. You get on my email list. I send emails out occasionally and do like webinars and stuff. Um, but that's that's where people can find me. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, everyone, if you want to learn more about, about Ben, obviously check out some of the things he's, he's telling you about. And uh, I hope we can have you on again sometime. We'll maybe go into more detail about some of the, the things we've touched on there. But um, for everyone listening, thank you for listening, for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to like, share, subscribe. And um, uh, we look forward to uh, giving you another another podcast, another interview. If you're interested in the raw vegan lifestyle, you can learn more at the UK Fruit Fest. You can go to fruitfest.co.uk to learn more about that there. But Ben, before we go, any last messages to people out there that are looking for a bit of encouragement and advice on, on their... Uh, healing journey? Um, I would just say nobody's healing journey is linear. No one gets it right the first time. Um, you know, keep learning, keep working at it. Um, you know, don't, 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 uh, give up just, um, you know, be receptive to new information and, you know, be the experimenter who tries everything out and, uh, learn for yourself and don't necessarily get caught up in anybody else's dogma. But, um, you know, that, that, that would be my advice. Thank you very much, Ben, and thanks you for joining us today. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us here on the Love Fruit Podcast, and we hope to see you in another one. All right. Thanks, Ronnie.